Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text that's going to engage us for this message is the last verse of our gospel lesson for this resurrection morning. It's Mark chapter 16, verse 8. They went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Here ends the resurrection gospel reading. Here ends the text. That's it? Really? That's where it ends? Afraid? How can it end with the word afraid? The angel just told them in verse 6, don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who is crucified. He is risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? Why don't they say, he is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. But instead... They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid? Is that where it ends? Well, that's not where I hope you end this resurrection morning after this message. But that is where Mark ends his message for us this morning. Right there in verse 8. Your Bibles likely have a notice about that, a little note right after verse 8 in the Bible. Here in this edition of the ESV, it says some early manuscripts do not include verse, chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. You see, the early church went on to finish the story, it added another 12 verses to the end of Mark. But this is where Mark ended the story. And this year... We're letting Mark, the evangelist, tell us the story of Jesus. In our lectionary readings in that cycle, this is the year for Mark's gospel. So on Good Friday, we let Mark, the evangelist, tell us the passion account of Jesus from chapters 14 and chapter 15. And here, on resurrection morning, we're letting Mark tell us the story of resurrection. Chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. And that's where it ends for they were afraid. Do you know Mark? Have you been introduced to him yet? If not, let me briefly introduce you. So Mark, the evangelist, was around during Jesus' ministry, but he's not one of the 12 disciples. He was too young for that. Acts chapter 12, verse 12, tells us that he has another name. His other name is John. And so often in the scriptures, he's called John Mark. Acts 12.12 12 also tells us that the early believers and the disciples all gathered together in his house, the house of his mother Mary, which suggests to us that if she had a house big enough for all these people to gather together, that Mark is from a fairly well-to-do family in Jerusalem. We're also told that Mark is Barnabas' cousin, Barnabas the Levite. Paul tells us that in Colossians 4, verse 10. And the Levites were of the priestly higher class in Jerusalem as well. And being a cousin to Barnabas, when Paul and Barnabas went out on their first mission journey to carry the gospel of Jesus, they took along a young John Mark with them. He was a part of that first mission journey. And then later in ministry, Mark ends up associated with Peter. And so in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, Peter said that Mark had become like a son to him during his ministry in Rome. And so many of the early church fathers suggest that when Mark shares his gospel, when he writes, he's writing the stories and details as have been related to him by Peter. Now, Mark's gospel is the only writing of Mark that we have in the Bible. This is Mark's chance to tell us the story of Jesus. And we could speculate when we read that in verse 8 about why these women would have run away fearing and afraid from the empty tomb, saying nothing to anyone. But if we get caught doing that, we might actually miss what Mark has to say to us for today. Because Mark's not actually writing to that first generation of disciples who would have witnessed the empty tomb. For they eventually did say something to other people. These ladies, too, eventually did tell the disciples. 
And so that's why the early church went on to finish the story and write the rest of the story, just as Matthew and Luke and John tell us the rest of the story of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances and how the disciples shared the news with one another. But that's not where Mark ends the story. Mark stops the story earlier because Mark's talking to the next generation of believers and the next generation and the next generation and the next generation all the way down to you and me. And that suggests that God who inspired Mark to write the story of Jesus knew that believers like you and me would need to deal with our fear on resurrection morning as well. And Mark knew something about that kind of fear. And remember I mentioned to you that Mark had gone with Paul and Barnabas on their first mission journey? <laughs> yeah, that didn't last long. By Acts 13, we're told <laughs> that Mark skipped out still near the beginning of that mission journey and went home. The way Paul describes it in Acts chapter 15, Mark abandoned them. Mark got cold feet, as it were. He left afraid and went home. Mark knew something about fear. We, we see that revealed in the gospel that he leaves for us as well. Not that Mark tells us at any point in the gospel where he happens to be in the story, but we see Mark identifying with different features of the story and characters of the story as the story of Jesus goes on. For example, remember that young man, that rich young man who came to Jesus asking about eternal life and Jesus said to him, go sell what you have and give to the poor and then you'll have treasures in heaven and the man went away sorrowful and disappointed because he had such great wealth. Mark can identify with that rich young man because Mark too grew up as a rich young man in Jerusalem. Oh, and let me give you another. You remember the night when Jesus is betrayed by Judas in the Garden of Gethsemane? And when he's betrayed by Judas, he's seized by the mobs? It's in Mark chapter 14. But Mark adds another feature to that story that none of the other gospel writers tell us about. Mark tells us that there's another young man who's tagging along with the disciples that night. A young man who's dressed in nothing but linen clothes. Mark can identify with that young man tagging along on the edge of Jesus' ministry. It's a young man dressed in linen clothes because it's the priestly class, the Levitical class in Jerusalem society that wore linen clothes. And Mark tells us that that night when they seized Jesus, that they seized this young man also. And that young man was so scared that he shed those linen clothes and ran away naked. <laughs> now, whether or not... Either of those two unidentified peripheral characters in the gospel is actually Mark is beside the point. The point is, is that Mark identifies with these characters in the story of Jesus. And when he identifies with them, he identifies with their fear because he too is fearful of letting go of his possessions in order to trust in Jesus. He's fearful of taking up his own cross and following Jesus as Lord. And he's writing to later generations who will also be fearful of these same things, who, like these women, will be fearful of going out and saying anything to anyone because they are afraid. What fears grip you this Easter morning? Is it like Mark? the fear of letting go of your security and your finances and possessions in order to trust in the Lord? Does, it, does that stop you from living generously and giving freely to others? Is it like Mark, the fear of what's coming along next? Is it, is it like Mark who abandoned Paul and Barnabas on that first mission journey for fear of the future, fear of what's coming up tomorrow and has you running away? Is it fear, uh, like Mark, of speaking for your faith in Jesus for fear of what others might think or do to you? Mark's speaking to a generation of people after him who, like him, will have the propensity to fear. 
when our kids were little, we read a lot of Dr. Seuss. And that's partly because one of my daughters shares a birthday with Dr. Seuss, Theodore Geisel. And among the different Dr. Seuss books we used to read when they were kids is this one that I just want to share a little bit of it with you this morning. It's from a larger collection of his books, but this little one is called, What Was I Scared Of? The book starts out this way. Well, I was walking in the night and I saw nothing scary, for I've never been afraid of anything. Not very. <laughs> then I was deep within the woods when suddenly I spied them, a pair of pale green pants with nobody inside them. <laughs> So I got out. I got out fast, as fast as I could go, sir. I wasn't scared by pants like that. I do not care for, no, sir. <laughs> the book goes on for several pages and how he tries to deal with and deny this fear. I said, I do not fear those pants with nobody inside them. I said and said and said these words. I said them, but I lied them. When we get towards the end of the story, we find out the only thing that can dispel that fear and cast it out in this little guy is having a face-to-face, -face, so to speak, person-to-person, -person, so to speak, meet up with those pants. <laughs> and he finds out they're actually quite loving pants. And so at the end of the story, he says, and now we meet quite often, those empty pants and I, and we never shake or tremble, we smile. And we say, hi. There are a group of young ladies fleeing from the empty tomb at the end of Mark's gospel. They got out as fast as they could go, sir. And maybe they said they didn't fear that tomb with nobody inside it. But if they said those words and said those words and said those words, they lied it. See, because the only thing that can dispel that fear, cast out that fear, is a face-to-face, person-to-person meet-up with that risen Savior. And that is what they're being invited to do that first Easter morning. It's there in verse 6. Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? And verse 7, go, tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. For that first generation that witnessed the empty tomb, they're being invited to go back and meet Jesus again in Galilee. And for the generation and the generation and the generation after them, the way that we go back and meet Jesus in Galilee, to meet up with him in person, so to speak, face to face, so to speak, is to go back to the beginning of Mark's gospel. You see, Mark's gospel doesn't begin where the other gospel writers begin theirs. He doesn't begin it in eternity with Jesus as the eternal word of God, one with the Father, the way John begins his gospel. He doesn't begin it in Bethlehem the way that Matthew and Luke begin their gospels with Jesus as just a little baby. Mark begins his gospel, chapter 1, introducing us to Jesus in Galilee. And if we go back to the beginning of that gospel and walk through the gospel again, now with eyes open that know him as the risen Lord and Savior, we can witness and be amazed with the disciples at his command over this world, over the wind and the waves, yes, but also sickness and over sin. We'll be awestruck hearing him speak words of forgiveness. Mark chapter 2, verse 5, to that paralytic who could not find his own way to Jesus because of the crowds. We'll be awestruck at his words of life and resurrection to a little girl in chapter 5 who in verse 40 and 41, everybody else had given up on, but Jesus raised her from the dead. We'll be awestruck with Mark over the words of love that pour from Jesus. Just like the love he had for that rich young man in Mark chapter 10. You see, this is another unique feature that Mark adds in his gospel that no other gospel writer tells us about, that Mark so identifies with that rich man in chapter 10, that in Mark chapter 10, verse 41, he tells us 
that Jesus, looking at that man, loved him. And Mark found his place again in that love of Jesus. And so will we. When we go back and meet Jesus again, we will find him speaking those forgiving words, those life-giving words, those loving words to us. And that word is transformative. Just ask the di disciples. They'll tell you about it. John will tell you about it. John will tell you it even casts out fear. First John chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, for perfect love casts out fear says John the disciple. And even though we're not actually meeting Jesus face to face, but we're, we're meeting him through the scriptures, through the witness of the evangelist, <laughs> Peter tells us that transforming power of God's life-giving, forgiving love, it's effective nonetheless. First Peter chapter 1, verse 8, Peter tells us, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him, and you rejoice with a joy that it's inexpressible and filled with glory. That is Easter joy. <laughs> it's Easter joy of knowing the forgiving and loving and life-giving words of Jesus spoken to us because we've met him again. Before we leave Mark's gospel this morning, I want to suggest to you that there's yet one more place, at least, that we see Mark identifying with one of the characters in the story of the gospel. And not identifying fearfully, like the young man who was seized and then fled and ran away naked in Mark chapter 14, which kind of parallels Mark as the young man who fled and left that first mission journey running away from Paul and Barnabas. But instead, more like the evangelist, the one who Peter later in his life said became like a son to him, the one whom Paul late in his ministry, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, said was a, a great help to him in ministry, that Mark. We find him in Mark 16 in the empty tomb, telling others about the risen Jesus and inviting them to meet him. Did you notice who was in the empty tomb at Mark 16? Well, the angel. But Mark doesn't describe this angel the way the other gospel writers describe him. You see, Luke chapter 24, verse 4, describes two angels, and they have dazzling appearance. And Mark chapter I mean, Matthew chapter 28, verse 3, describes the angel, his appearance is just one angel, but he's like lightning. And on account of him, even the soldiers tremble and fall, become like dead men. Mark doesn't describe him like that. Mark describes him in much gentler terms. As a young man, verse 5, sitting dressed in white, saying, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He is not here. He is risen. Come, see the place where they have laid him. And go, as tell his disciples and Peter that he's gone before you into Galilee, and there you will see him. There is a young man in the empty tomb this morning inviting you to meet again the risen Jesus. Even if you count yourself a disciple already, go back and meet him. Go back to the beginning of the gospel story. Go back to the gospels and read them again and again and again and experience that forgiving, that life-giving, that loving word of Jesus. I, actually, truly, I, I'm challenging you to do this. <laughs> For the next 50 days, go back and read the gospel stories and, and pick any gospel you want. Read Mark's gospel if you want to or read Matthew's or Luke's or John's or, or read each of them. But I'm challenging you for the next 50 days between now and Pentecost because Pentecost is, is the time when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples and they began to preach about Jesus in earnest. So between now and then, spend the time meeting again the risen Jesus
Go back into the Gospels every day for 10 minutes a day. Read from the Gospel story of Jesus from one of the Gospels for 10 minutes and then spend 10 minutes reflecting on that reading and asking yourself, where do I see myself in this story? And then after 50 days at Pentecost, look at what happens to the level of fear in your life. Let me give you a clue. 1 John 4, 18. Perfect love casts out fear. <laughs> you see, if the gospel story of Jesus were simply written like a Dr. Seuss story, well, it might be like this. And now we meet quite often the risen Jesus and I. There's no need to shake or tremble. He smiles when I say hi. In Jesus' name, amen. There are many of you who've been using our sermons regularly for worship. We want to thank you for continuing to engage with us. And we want to invite you to experience something new. We have been putting full worship services with music and everything on our website for people to use. Uh, but those, because of copyright reasons, we're not able to post on our YouTube channel. And so instead, we are starting something new. We won't be doing the full music worship services online anymore. But here after Easter, we are going to do what we call simple home worship. We'll still be providing the sermon just by itself. If you just want to listen to the sermon, you can get to that on the YouTube channel or you can get to that on our website. But in addition to that, we'll be providing simple home worship which is the sermon, but it'll start off with an invocation and a confession, and we'll actually read the scripture readings for the day, and then we'll have the sermon. We'll have prayers after the sermon, the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and we'll close it with a benediction. You're welcome to put whatever songs into that you want, pause it at any time and sing a song, listen to some Christian music on the radio, but it'll give you more of an experience of worship. And, and that simple home worship, we can actually post on our YouTube channel and on the website. So you'll find both there. Just giving you another opportunity for worship and to invite others to experience the risen Jesus.